Okay, well, Prandar, good afternoon, um, everybody. Thank you very much for your patience while we just um, straighten things out there. And a very warm welcome indeed to the first meeting for 2022 um, of the Welsh Fellows Group of the Society of Antiquaries of London. Um, it's a sadness, of course, that current situations mean that this one too has to be um, a online meeting um, only, although we're very much hopeful that is the last um, such event um, and that we'll be able to move to in-person and hybrid or fully hybrid meetings uh, from now onwards. Um, at the very, very end of this hour, I will run through extremely briefly what the plans are of the Welsh Fellows Group um, for the uh, coming year. Um, but without further ado, I do want us to move into the um, talk that Mark Lodwick is very kindly uh, giving us today. Um, I will note too that if you would like to ask questions um, of the speaker, uh, the system that we have to use is that please will you use the chat function um, that's available through Zoom. I'm certain everybody will be more than familiar with that um, by now. Um, and those questions have to come to the uh, small group of panelists um, and we will then organize them um, and present them through to Mark. Um, our speaker this afternoon graduated from Cardiff University um, and after that, um, he volunteered for the excavation of a Neanderthal cave site in North Wales, um, which was run by the National Museum of Wales. He was subsequently invited to undertake post-excavation work at the museum and then began to be offered opportunities to work with the National Museum on a number of short-term contracts and fieldwork projects. Um, but it was while he was supervising the excavation of a Viking Age site on Anglesey, I think I can guess what that one is, where two metal detectorists had recovered and recorded finds with the National Museum um, uh, pre to the Portable Antiquities Scheme. One of the finders joined the excavation team um, and at this point Mark became aware of the importance of engaging the public with archaeology. He moved to the Portable Antiquities Scheme in, to, in Wales in 2001, hence, of course, his title. Working with the PAS enabled him to respond to significant discoveries made in Wales with the support of colleagues in archaeology at the National Museum. Of particular note was the discovery and excavation of the later prehistoric feasting site at Llan Mice in the Vale of Glamorgan. Nine excavation seasons at Llan Mice revealed a significant Bronze Age landscape where communities lived and buried their dead. Later, through the Late Bronze and the Iron Ages, people began to arrive to feast and carefully deposited the extensive material culture from those gatherings in a curated midden. In recent years, there's been less opportunity to conduct fieldwork, although internationally important discoveries continue to be identified, such as the recent uncovering of an Iron Age chariot, chariot burial in Pembrokeshire, the first that has been recorded from Southern Britain. Colleagues at Cardiff University persuaded Mark to supervise excavations of an Iron Age hill fort in Germany in 2018 and 2019, and working with the university has also led to opportunities to teach archaeological photography and artefact analysis. Uh, so Mark, it's with great pleasure that I hand over to you for your presentation this afternoon. Thank you. Many thanks, John. Thank you. So I'll just share the screen with everyone. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. So, um, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Lodwick. I've worked for the Portable Antiquities Scheme for 20 years. Um, I'm sorry for the slightly glib title. I was expecting to be doing this in person um, and slightly more informally, but um, I've had to back up my ideas now and being kind of broadcast a little more widely. So, um, I'm sorry that some of this talk today is fairly structural um, around portable antiquities, um, but I think it's important to get some messages across. Um, where we do have these very rich text slides, I've tried to balance it with um, an artifact. Please don't go looking for a link between the text and the artifact. There isn't one. It's purely there as a distraction, um, but hopefully a nice distraction. 
But um, in terms of background, maybe a little background to the background, first of all. So um, I'm sure many of you know that Portable Antiquities um, began initially in England in 1997 um, in conjunction with the introduction of new legislation to deal with treasure finds. And I think archaeologists very rightly were wondering, well, what about everything else? What about all this incredibly significant archaeological item? archaeological material culture that is being recovered by members of the public every year, but is going unrecorded or piecemeal recording based on links with um, various museums and metal detecting communities, but there is no coherent structure in order for that we recover that information. So um, in 1997, it was begun in various areas of England, and in 1999, Wales got on board. Um, initially overseen by a colleague, um, Dr. Phil McDonald, who moved to Ireland. Um, but he worked in the scheme for two years and established it very successfully. Um, the organisation of the scheme in Wales had to be slightly different. So it was envisaged that a finds coordinator post would oversee the scheme um, and coordinate a network of reporting centres comprising local regional museums and archaeological trusts. The problem with that approach was that there was no real um, resources made available to museums across Wales to undertake it, and a very small amount of money was made available to the, to the trusts. So that model was in some ways slightly flawed, but it's what we worked with um, for a good decade or so until we had limited kind of new resources to deal with it slightly differently. Um, and maybe an instigator of that was that in 2010, um, management of the central PS scheme was moved to the British Museum as the MLA kind of went out of use and became ring-fenced funding from Renaissance in the Regions, which has um, an English only remit. And on top of that, Wales was, had become a devolved nation itself and it didn't really make much sense for Westminster funding to be coming into Wales for this scheme. And um, we looked to the Welsh government to fund it and they stepped in in 2010 so that the scheme in Wales is funded by the Welsh government through three funding bodies, Amgiad of Cymru, um, Cardu and Mald, each as equal partners in the funding of the scheme. The four Welsh archaeological trusts um, maintained a small amount of funding to coordinate um, the scheme as well in their area. So um, what's happened since we have kind of got independence for PS Cymru? Um, I think initially they, we were slow to kind of pick up on what we could do, but um, I made the case very strongly that it wasn't really a good use of my time to go to monthly metal detector meetings in northeastern Wales, which is a kind of long haul, um, once or twice a month for the two metal detecting clubs up there. So we successfully fundraised um, with the Headley Trust for an intern post initially based at um, National Museum Merseyside in Liverpool for them to, with a Wales, northeast Wales remit to do some work there for us. And that was really successful, certainly for myself, um, it saved some time. But actually we noticed that a dedicated kind of post, although it's a part-time post, really kind of helps maintain that kind of developer relationship with someone who's on the ground more often. And we saw a treasure number increase, uh, increase as well, which enabled us to kind of make the point very strongly that, that when that heavily trust funded in turn post ended that Welsh government public money should kind of step in to continue that, to ensure that it continues. Um, as John mentioned, in 2019, I kind of forged more links with Cardiff University and went to a part-time post, which gave us an opportunity to employ um, another post, which actually ended up being a job share of two volunteers who worked with me, uh, a little more on them later. So there is a full-time post dedicated to recording art art artifacts that are coming in at Cardiff. And then more recently, we've commissioned an independent evaluation, which I'll talk a little bit more about towards the end. Um, and that's enabled us to make the case that we need um, further kind of resources to, to work 
on the scheme and we've been successful in securing the funding for a part-time fines officer based in Swansea, which we um, just interviewed last week. And um, hopefully there should be somebody in post there soon. We've also been successful in an engagement officer post based on a Saving Treasures Telling Stories project that you'll hear about in the talk as well. Um, and we were unsuccessfully in pointing from the first round there, but we, that'll be advertised again soon. And um, we also have applied for funding for a Headley, another Headley Trust intern post. Um, this one is came about initially through a scheme set up by PS centrally in England to look at a PS reaction to the Black Lives Matter protests and recognizing that there are difficult barriers for people um, to work in heritage and, um, and they may be because of ethnicity, because of um, disability barriers and because of poverty barriers. So we were keen to apply for money to enable an intern officer, intern officer to, to gain experience in working with us um, in a slightly non-traditional route into heritage. And I, I think and I hope that heritage will be much richer from hearing those voices who maybe aren't represented um, in heritage currently. And I'm very pleased to say that we've been very successful in a very different selection process, because remember the interviews this time, it wasn't about testing knowledge, what they knew, it was kind of us having to explain what we can do for them. And uh, Clara de Souza will be starting with us, I think literally we're just sorting this out today, but it seems as if the 7th of February will be their start day and they're gonna work with us part-time, or she's going to work with us, I should say, part-time for the next 13 months. So we are growing as a team and it is developing. Um, PS has a key role in treasure and um, I think it's fair to say that we're involved with something like 90% or more of the treasure cases that are reported and possibly, um, I wouldn't like to put a figure on it, but a large significant um, amount of those fines maybe wouldn't be reported without us as PS staff on the ground saying actually this is likely to be a treasure case, or we'd like to pursue this as a potential treasure case, this needs to come in. So it's that kind of face-to-face -face outreach and the engagement that we have with finder communities that enables us to kind of recognize initially those treasure cases. And I think you can see that uh, in Wales, since the introduction of the Treasure Act in 1997, cases have been, although modest, continue to grow. COVID had um, an impact last year, and that impact is not so much in finding, but in reporting where we couldn't meet people. Um, and some of the larger numbers from 2021 are some of those fines coming in that may initially have been made in 2020. You can see that it fluctuates a little. Uh, in 2018, it may, well, I think there's a factor that I um, took some of that year off because I, had, I was forced to catch up with some leave. So I wasn't around in detector meetings for a large part of that year as well. So that may have had um, something of an impact in 2018. But cases are strong and there's a good kind of case for the kind of PS representation within those treasure statistics. And also we notice that when we do people people on the ground, um, we see those treasure cases in those areas increasing. So um, what I'd like to talk about this afternoon is some key strands um, about what I see as kind of highlight successes of PS Cymru. Um, so the kind of headline is always number of fines and that's 65,000 fines recorded from Wales now on the database. Um, and those numbers obviously are, support, are important, but I think there's also um, a qualitative as well as kind of quantitative element to this. So the strands that I'd like to pull out are, in terms of archaeology and research is Bronze Age Wales comes across very, very strongly. Um, so as John mentioned, I think um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the first midden site at Clan Mice that we've discovered through the work of PS and our contacts with um, Angela the Camry National Museum of Wales. Deposition of Bronze Age metalwork as well has been a, a very strong element within the kind of research we've been doing, the amount of work that we have. 
And I think there's some interesting stories to tell there. The Romans in Northeast Wales is something that's just emerging through the work that our Wrexham finds officer Susie White is um, undertaking. And I think that's something that's developing at the moment. There's less I should say about that because it's Susie's work and others, um, but I'd just like to reference it. Engagement, PS often describes itself as the UK's largest community archeology span project and engagement is a vital part of our work. And um, there's been a project that uh, PS Cymru has been a third partner in um, called Saving Treasures Telling Stories, funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund. And that's pulled together a lot of this research and engagement work as well. Outreach is key to the successes of PS Cymru. And um, I think I count myself as being very lucky in having a good relationship and the support of finder communities, metal detecting communities, who at difficult times have always kind of um, supported and helped the work we do. So I think that shouldn't be underplayed either. So as I mentioned, um, Wrexham, we have Dr. Susie White, who is the finds officer working part-time at a Wrexham Museum. And that's the model we're using to base the new successful application we've put in for a finds post at Swansea. Uh, so that'll be a part-time post based in Swansea Museum. And um, the an interesting and very significant important find is this Roman lead pig or ingot that was discovered by metal detectorist. Um, I don't suppose you have to have a very sophisticated metal detector to, to discover that. But that really has been the springboard to a whole series of archaeological kind of work and progress to understand that in its context, both its kind of chronological and landscape context. Wrexham Museum was able to acquire the pig and it was recently um, included in the British Museum's Nero exhibition as well, which I think Susie supported with um, a talk around it, which is great. So I see this as kind of what PS should be doing and the key strengths of portable antiquities. It's not just about recording finds, it's as archeologists, we want to understand the bigger questions behind it, we want to look for the context, we want to understand the context, and we want to put it in that landscape context. So um, Wrexham Museum were able to acquire the finds and that again is the best kind of results for us when our most important archeological material culture ends up in museums and is looked after, cared for, interpreted um, for the public as, as a whole. And then working with Chester Museum, and Caroline Pudsey, they've look, they've identified um, through crop marks and geophysics, a suggested Roman villa, which there was an initial excavation last year. And I understand from Susie that there'll be another six week excavation this summer to understand that kind of landscape, landscape better and the Romans in what is now Northeast Wales and links to Chester and everything else. So I think that's a positive emerging story for PS Cymru. So more recently, um, George Watley, um, who is a recent graduate at Cardiff University and a very talented um, young archaeologist, and Adele Bricking, who's at the tail end of her PhD research, have a job share in doing the recording of the archaeological objects um, from Cardiff. So watch this space as their job, uh, their involvement and their research interests perhaps develop within the role. And as I mentioned, um, their work, all of their works, I suppose, will be um, supported by the intern post, which starts at Cardiff next month, and the new finds officer post in Swansea. So I referenced earlier a key success and the key theme within the last few years um, as Saving Treasures Telling Stories, which is a HLF funded, Heritage Lottery funded project, as it was. Um, and a partnership between Amgev of Cymru, PS Cymru, and the Federation of Museums in Wales. And we were successful in securing £450,000 worth of funding to enable museums across Wales to engage with communities, um, both finder communities and the public more widely, to acquire archaeological objects, material culture that we feel should be in museums. And um, that is very strongly stressed that it's museums across Wales, not just on the other which is why the Federation of Museums in Wales are a partner. 
a lot of those finds were treasure finds, um, but also it was trying to create a culture um, to ensure that other important, significant archaeological finds find a home in local regional museums across Wales. And also we there was money to develop training to enable local regional museum curators um, to make links with archaeological material culture, perhaps even between museums and different diverse collections, maybe where, for example, um, jewelry of medieval or post-medieval date is shown on paintings. And if that is coming in through the Treasure Act, you know, that those can make really nice links. This is a nice infographic that was prepared for us um, on successes of the project. So as you can see, it's nearly £350,000 of the funding, which was topped up um, with find, funding in like. We worked with 27 museums across Wales. There were um, 168 acquisitions, uh, 93 of which were by local regional museums. A large number of the acquisitions that were made by Amgilva um, Cymru is where we stood in, where there weren't local regional museums um, that were appropriate to acquire, such as in the Vale of Glamorgan, where we do tend to find a lot of material culture is found. And there were six um, major community archaeology projects um, run by the local regional museums, but supported by the um, body that oversaw it and by Portable Antiquities. So when putting this bid together, we were kind of tasked with giving the HLF examples of projects we'd like to run. But I saw them as very much responding to new discoveries. So it was very difficult to kind of suggest projects for um, discoveries that hadn't yet been made. But um, I did think of a huge amount of kind of important archaeological material that was being discovered in Swansea Bay. And I thought I'd use that as an example. And that became one of the big initial community projects working alongside Swansea Museum. Um, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about that project, um, both the project and the archaeology that's coming out of the bay. So metal detectorists had kind of been going to the area for a number of years, um, but in the last um, 15 years since I've been doing the post, we're uncovering a huge amount of really significant archaeological material that I think it's fair to say we didn't really understand. I was kind of beginning to see the landscape, archaeological landscape, as perhaps akin in some ways to areas of the seven levels, where the seven levels research committee kind of um, research, publish, and do lots of work on. But nobody was looking at great detail at the finds coming, finds or the archaeology in Swansea Bay. Um, Clamorgan Grant Archaeological Trust had done some work both recording and publishing work of trackways. So these wooden trackways started to emerge. They're radiocarbon dated to the Bronze Age and the Iron Age into the early Roman period. Um, I think there are six or seven different trackways or parts of trackways, we don't know how they link up, that have been uncovered and um, examined to some extent within the bay. And here you can see a slightly old, but some of the areas where some of the finds are being discovered across the bay with no obvious signs of kind of um, distribution cluster, but um, maybe suggesting slight patterns. And then as a wonderful uh, fortuitous event, I became aware of this wonderful, wonderful find, maybe one of the nicest finds I've had the privilege to record in the post. This is an early Bronze Age beaker flint dagger and not only is it a kind of fantastic artifact, but the story behind it, both its archaeological story and its more recent um, finder story are just wonderful. And this was a great kind of springboard for this community project that we wanted to do um, called the Lost Treasures of Swansea Bay, um, which I have to say the Swansea Museum ran, but we were able to support. So this wonderful dagger was found by this chap here, Mr. Paul Tambling, in 1971, and Paul had um, just found it on the beach. That is the day, a snap that he took, or the day he found it in 1971. He's a very different character today. 
um, he put it in his pocket and um, he valued this object. He understood it to be flint and probably a flint tool, but didn't really understand very much about it. But imbued incredible significance over this over the years. But it wasn't until um, a few years ago that he decided to find out exactly what it was, which is where obviously the portable antiquity scheme kind of stepped in. And when I was able to kind of tell Paul what it was and some of the meanings behind it, and you know, its age and everything else, you know, Paul genuinely welled up. And that emotional kind of connection to the object was plain and wonderful. It was clear that this perhaps um, yet wasn't ready for a museum collection. I hope one day that it will be. So what we were able to do was get an expert flint knapper, Carl Lee, who you can see that picture, trying to create one. It took him all day and he didn't get it as thin. He kind of confessed that if he tried to thin it anymore, he was pretty sure that he'd break the flint. So it's not quite as fine, but it's a very nice kind of replica. And that was a public event that we could do as part of that Saving Treasures Telling Stories um, project. So this is elements of Saving Treasures, um, Lost Treasures of Swansea Bay, where we engage with the public with a whole load of events. Um, one of my favorites being a beachcombing session with the Young Archaeologist Club and um, the Young Writers Group from Dylan Thomas Center which we're using objects we found and then the group curated and put on display in Swansea Museum to think about kind of narratives behind them and create creative writing around both the archeological material coming from the Bay and um, the objects that they'd managed to find themselves and understand and then curate. So um, just like to tell you quite briefly, some of the objects that are coming out of the Bay. And what we notice is a concentration of bladed implements. I think it means something. I think the selecting um, this maybe liminal zone for deposition of bladed implements on a far, far greater kind of scale than we see um, in land. So there's something like 30 bladed implements um, that I've recorded from the Bay in the last few years. And maybe that Bikadaga has some as a very early start of that kind of practice too. The objects, the Bronze Age objects that are coming out of the bay aren't usual. They're not the kind of material that we find in hoards um, on dryland sites. So these are just a couple of examples. On the right there, you can see um, a late Bronze Age folded knife. This is the first one from Southern Britain. Um, generally, they're found in Scotland and Ireland in coastal or watery kind of areas, um, but not, not in Southern Britain. There's a fragment of socketed sickle and a quite kind of strange gouge. Um, we get winged axes, which are more, uh, more generally found with the Carp's Tongue complex, which we see less of in southeastern Wales. Um, very dumpy, odd looking little gouges. Um, beautiful decorated um, flame bladed um, socketed spearhead and the biggest um, cup headed pin that I could find recorded. And what I became aware of is that I was often saying this is the first in this area, the first from Southern Britain, the first from Wales, or I can't find a parallel, a good parallel to this. So this is what kind of made me really want to concentrate on a project based around the archaeology of Swansea Bay. And then in the top is a penanula ring as well, showing an element of personal decoration and status. And wonderfully, it's not confined to the Bronze Age. Um, looking a little bit later in, in prehistory, into the end of the Iron Age and into the Roman period, we see some chariot fittings and um, a bridal bit that have been recovered from the bay. This is a selection of them. Whether these have anything to do with the trackway is um, a possibility. There's personal adornment. So we, here we have a number of brooches. Again, a little bit unusual, some of them. Um, it's quite odd um, to find Pananula brooches and the Crossborough brooch there in the center, they're generally found on a military site, but not constructed in this way. It's a very odd brooch in that it's made of sheet metal, which is very carefully and skillfully folded rather than a cast bronze object, which is what we normally find. 
into the medieval period. Um, and what we tend to see then, um, the odd vessel, but um, a larger amount, a larger concentration of pilgrim souvenirs. So here's an assortment of uh, various forms with Tom Beckett well represented within it. Um, so there's a number of those. And an interpretation of that is that people were arriving back um, to near their homeland, perhaps, and were thankful for their um, safe passage and maybe would offer one of these souvenirs they picked up on their pilgrimage as a thanks when they got back to the beach. Moving into the post-medieval period, there's wonderful stories, I think, to be told, which we never exploited quite in the right way, I thought, for trade tokens of 17th century date that are being recovered from the beach. So there's a whole, whole load of them, hundreds now. And um, these are some of the local ones, um, which you might expect from Swansea, Neath and Carmarthen. But um, there's also a lot from the West Country, there's a whole load from Ireland, and then all across Europe, there are countries, areas, regions represented. And I think there's wonderful stories to be told there. I mean, the obvious story is about trading partners and um, ships coming in and going out from these areas during the 17th century and early Swansea. Um, but it would be lovely to kind of do a little bit more about with links to these countries and what it can tell us. Some of these tokens were previously unrecorded. And I think um, it would have been nice in the project that we done a little swapping of people, uh, maybe a little bit of travel, but uh, maybe the time's passed for that now. So moving on to the Bronze Age kind of more generally, and I think Bronze Age treasures, and I mean this both with a large T as in treasure as in the legal definition, and a small T. So, the deposition of Bronze Age metalwork in Wales, there is a particular concentration. And since the Treasure Act was extended to cover base metal associated groups, including um, hordes of Bronze Age metalwork, there have been um, 50 hordes from Wales. And that's a large number. It's bigger than other areas. Um, comp comparable areas across Britain. And it's very significant, I think. And people in certain areas of Wales, it's concentrated again, Southeast Wales being a particular kind of focus. And people are choosing to deposit large collections of metalwork. They were previously referred to as founders or smith swords, they're not. There's much more selection, treatment, and care taken over these objects, um, buried uh, you know, towards the end of the first millennium BC. Um, but also treasures with a little tea. Um, so here is an example, just one of um, a recent find of a mould to cast, a bronze mould to cast bronze pulse staves from the Middle Bronze Age. Um, it's a great group three low flange pulse stave from uh, Penderi in Swansea. And Saving Treasures actually was able to acquire this for Swansea Museum. It's one of only, um, well, three groups that have ever been recovered from Wales, it's two from North Wales. And this is the first from South, not from Swansea Bay, but still um, an incredibly important find. And there are over 500 single objects of bronze recorded on the Portable Antiquities Scheme database. And that's significant. And I think maybe archaeologically there is an issue with the way we treat hordes, which remember could be two axes together, and the way we treat single objects. But I think not always, but often, the practice is similar, or at least comparable. Um, if you deposit a hoard and you deposit a single object, I think the same kind of ideas uh, are expressed in that depositional act, but maybe as archeologists, we're treating them very, very differently and we see them as different. So we perhaps need to think about that. So it's great that very recently, Chris Griffiths has joined us. Um, he works, um, doing a PhD on this depositional practice. So I, I won't say too much about it because it's Chris's work, obviously, um, but watch this space and hopefully at some point, um, Chris will be able to speak as well on the work he's been doing to look at depositional practices within South Wales and what all these hoarding, what all these hoarding events mean. And perhaps hopefully a little bit about this difference between how we treat single objects and hoards.
Just a little bit about kind of what I've been thinking um, as these hordes are coming up and the depositional practices that kind of I've been keen to explore. One of which is what is clearly deliberate damage to access. Um, and people have talked about sacrifice. Um, and this is one of the reasons I think why they were often described as founders of Smith swords and may be dismissed for those reasons. And I think there's something perhaps more significant happening. What you tend to see is that objects are forced into sockets, largely of axes, with significant force. It's not done by accident. Sometimes, occasionally, as you can see on the example on the left, it'll split this, these very substantial objects um, open. Often it's socketed objects within the sockets of the axes or protruding objects. Blades are often um, chopped off axes. It's not something that happens in damage to these axes, but they're chopped off where they are. Those blades will never be represented in the hordes, but blades from other axes might be. I began to wonder whether there's a kind of um, gender element being expressed within this metalwork material culture. So um, are these in some way fertility rituals where um, various elements of both axes and other objects are represented by the insertion of um, various elements into sockets. But I'm prepared to accept I may be thinking too much about these things. Another thing we've noticed, or to be precise, a colleague, um, Dr. Mary Davis noticed when we we're recording this, as archaeologists, I really don't think too much about patinations and corrosion products on objects, um, but we should be. So Mary noticed from this axe in particular that these corrosion products you can see on the top of this, this black corrosion product isn't natural, isn't a natural corrosion product you'd expect from a copper alloy and it's a tenorite. And um, we're suggesting that that's been deliberately applied to the coating of these axes. So this is something that archeologists were never aware of before that these axes were colored, possibly black and then, when you think about the axe, the, the ribs would make perhaps more sense as a striking element, which would be golden the golden color of bronze and presumably the sharpened blade and the rest of the axe may be black. In this instance, you can see a kind of element of what's nearly a kind of similar to bronze solder that um, when these two axes, was, it was connected to another axe and when it was recovered from the ground, these axes were kind of molded together. The side view shows us that the patination, this tenorite, doesn't cover the damaged element of um, the loop on the axe and therefore was applied before the loop broke. I'd stress that um, the field work to understand these depositions is really important and going out, meeting finders, explaining archaeological in process is a really significant element of the work we do. And we've always tried to do that. Um, the bottom picture is a team of archaeologists and finders trying to find a white stone that marked a fine spot of a hoard that was discovered in the Villa Glamorgan before a foot of snow fell. We eventually did find it and do that excavation. Um, sometimes we find context and other times we don't. This is where a finder reported um, associated group of two pulse staves. And when we went out, we found that it was um, buried within um, a very nice rock cut feature, a late a middle bronze age feature, I should say, which is part of a field system, we think. Um, this perhaps is one of the very few instances where the finders um, left objects in situ for us to recover. Um, and this provided us with various opportunities to understand the objects and cultures, what we really wanted to do, but it was also within the Saving Treasures program. So it was a wonderful opportunity to engage with um, the finder communities, the extended family of the landowner, lots and lots of different people. Cardiff University became involved um, and we were able to try and understand that context a little better. What we did find is that the archaeology is far more complicated than we expected. There are at least three, at least two, probably three intercutting features where people, in the late Bronze Age, revisited that site and deposited different artifacts at different times. We don't have the resolution to know how far apart they were, but I think that's really significant. 
Um, this is some of the finds being recovered during excavation, but it also gives a wonderful opportunity to look at these axes um, in a little more detail and work with a really wonderful um, bronze caster called Neil Burridge, who's based in Cornwall. We sent him all the details he needed of one of the axes we recovered, and he made us a number of replicas of that particular axe. We, I was really keen that we use that replica, not just to display, but to try it out. And I was keen to see, uh, some of you might be aware of the, of the finds being recovered from Must Farm. One of the axes there is on a beam, not in the way we traditionally perhaps envisage these axes being hafted. So I was keen to see how that would work on a hafted axe. And this working with experimental archeologists at Cardiff University, um, Ian Dennis in particular, and here you can see Pete Forward, who is an archeologist in the area, trying out one of these axes. And we use this extensively. I was kind of keen to use it until it broke, but we didn't get that far. We blunted it many times. Um, but actually that is part of the story of this hoard. So that now is um, on display with the group and a kind of pristine replica as well. And there you can see the hood on display um, with some of the replicas, that axes around the corner. But the, that display was curated by a group of young people we worked with and experimental archeology span is incorporated. So I think it's a more holistic way of looking at both the research behind these collections, how we involve the public and their ultimate interpretation on display. Right. I think I was going to move on and tell you um, about Clan Mice. I'm very aware of time and we have very touched on it at the basis. So maybe that we should leave that for a, a different talk. And I'll just skip through a lot of that for now. Interesting though it is. Um, and just bring you up to speed with where we are in PS Cymru. I'm back to the kind of um, slightly less archaeological, but really important elements. And I mentioned at the beginning that we've had a recent evaluation. I'm not usually keen to see public money go to kind of consultants to, um, to address issues, but this has worked out very well, I feel. And what Ruth Garnett, who, commission, who was commissioned to do this evaluation of PS Cymru, was able to draw out was the recommendations and aligning those with Welsh government agendas and particularly the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. So if you remember, PS Cymru is funded by the Welsh Government. If we can ensure that what the work we do and the aspirations we have is aligned to Welsh Government agendas, then the idea is that we can um, free more of the funding that we need to ensure that PS Cymru is more sustainable. So these are kind of the key recommendations. It was so heartening that Ruth in the conversations we had, just got it, got what PS should be, um, which is at the heart of this is recording archaeological material culture um, and find the communities and then maintaining those relationships. So her recommendations were, as far as I was concerned, absolutely correct. And then um, she was able to express that and report back for us to Welsh Government, enable to enable us to put on a firmer footing, hopefully for the future. And these are where um, Ruth was able to draw out and how some of these recommendations fit very, very well into um, Welsh government legislation and ensure that um, we're a part of that as the PS Cymru goes on into the future. So this is very new but it's a very useful tool that we now have to ensure that um, PS Cymru is, is sustainable and hopefully continues to grow. So, um, as I said, I haven't even got time to mention the kind of internationally significant recent find of the chariot burial, but I'm aware of time. So thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have that have come up from that talk. Thank you. 
Lovely. Well, thank you very, very much indeed, Mark. And um, yeah, it's dis disappointing also for the people who are listening that you had to um, <laughs> uh, cut it short. But um, we will definitely have to have you back um, before long to talk about things. Of course, of course, some of us have heard talks on uh, fan mice in, in other contexts um, as well. Um, and uh, the, that Swansea Bay stuff was absolutely fascinating. Um, well, I'll um, give a little bit of time for um, questions questions to come in um, through the chat, but you'll be relieved to know that I have uh, more than enough questions, all of my own, to fill in any um, embarrassing um, gap here. But I'd actually like to, much as I think sometime we're going to have to sit down and talk about Swansea Bay, but that will take a day. Um, I'd actually like to start on the final point um, you were making, which was about that consultancy um, that you had re consultants report you'd had to have and um, just how positive, slightly unexpectedly positive you felt um, about the, 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 the whole um, thing. Uh, the question I've actually got is, is this something that is becoming distinctive to the situation in Wales and the the size of the country, the size of the scheme and the scope for the relationship between the Welsh, the PAS in Wales and the Welsh government and its uh, various agencies or divisions or whatever they would strictly be called. Um, I, do you have a feel for how different or similar the situation is to, to both England and Scotland um, in this respect? That's an interesting question. I think things are very different in Scotland because the legislation to deal with antiquities is different in Scotland. So all archaeological objects need to be reported there. In England, the scheme is much, much bigger. So remember, there are some 30 odd people employed in England and it's a multi-million pound scheme. Mm. So it's always been very conservative in Wales. And I think um, because it's largely over the last 20 years before CUZ was able to join me in 2016, 17, it was just myself purely employed to work on PS. So it was very modest. And I think we were working very hard to record and show the worth of the scheme, but that kind of, that organized approach to Welsh government um, just wasn't there. So I think we needed something like this, a consultation to just draw out all of these points and present it to Welsh government and say, look, we're doing this work that you value, um, but it needs to be bigger. If we need to maximize the kind of impact and the amount of potential of this scheme, it needs to be invested in. And um, fingers crossed, that's, that to me seems to be working. If that answers your question, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 it 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 does, and it it's interesting that it may be a point where the the the, the relative conservative of Wales, which I, I know what you're talking about, um, has actually hit a point where it's moved ahead of what's possible in England, where inertia almost has to follow from the size and the um, sort of locally atomized versions of the scheme that are having to be operated on the, on the basis of so, so much larger an administrative um, uh, country there. Yeah, um, I think that's right. It is, it is a sizable, significant scheme and maybe is a little less difficult. It's, it's a little more difficult to move in a particular direction. Yeah, once it's up and running, it's a bit of a kind of juggernaut there, mm, but absolutely. very successful, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the 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 revision to the Treasure Act was that a, a treasure? Is that again a Treasure Act for England and Wales, or is there separate legislation? No, the Treasure Act covers England and Wales. It is um, right. So, so it, that yeah. was um, a review that came through in two thousand and two, which is the last time the Treasure Act changed. Um, something I haven't mentioned today is that we're currently under review and they're looking at the Treasure Act again. And it looks oh, as right. if, very interestingly, they're going along the lines of not just um, gold and silver, but a significant element to it, which is going to be a very interesting development if it happens. Right. Yes, indeed. Well, I, I, I was aware of that and I assumed it had already come through. But obviously, the, the, this thing of the collections of base metal um, that you talked about before. Um, are there any other variants to um, the basically so much of a precious metal in the object, then it becomes treasure? Or is it well, really only those metal hoards? 
For prehistoric dates, it's, it's yeah. more than one base metal object associated and anything that's associated with it. Yeah. Um, so it's and then when you move into the historic period, it's anything over three hundred years old that's more than ten percent precious metal and anything with it. For coins, it's also base metal. So it's two or more precious metal coins or ten or more base metal okay. coins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's it, it's it's a bit better than we thought, but um, nevertheless, you know, the, I think well, most of us would agree there's further it could go. So yeah, I think precious metal doesn't necessarily. For us as archaeologists, doesn't denote the most significant finds, and that's been quite frustrating. So yeah. significance will be an interesting development, but legislating for significance could be a challenge too. Yeah, great. Um, I've got a question that's come in from Francis um, Llewellyn, which um, I'm having to sort of interpret. But I think the question is, um, is the, the publication um, of finds beyond just the PAA PA, PAS list um, and a photo illustration. Is that PAS funded? I think that's where the question is focused at. Or is there a funded illustration of the finds? No, Rather there isn't. Publicate. Right. So um, what's, it, it's more of an ad hoc relationship. So I think um, this the post of the finds coordinator based at the National Museum yeah. Um, where I was able to draw on illustration and curatorial expertise heavily. And I still am to a certain degree, um, but because of various changes within the National Museum, it's, it's a little trickier these days. And um, the more traditional ways of publishing material aren't really available. Yeah. Um, and that is an issue because I think the more significant objects, like some of these pictured here, actually, um, although some of them have been published separately, things can get lost in this huge vat of kind of finds. And they do need to be kind of pulled out, drawn upon, researched, and the academic audience need to be made aware of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, it's not just the academic audience, is it? It's, you know, it's, it's so difficult to pre... Um, presupposes not quite the right word but to to anticipate exactly how many people will have perfectly reasonable and good interests um, in all of these things and I, I, th I think I agree with Francis you know that uh, to get something whereby regularly um, you know we were able to sort of look through you know what has come in and to different people different things will stand out and and come to them. So it's, I, I think it is an important point. I think it's, it, it, it is a very important point. It's something yeah. we should be doing more of. Um, yeah. I get the sense that um, in terms of funding, it's much easier to find funding to do with engagement these days and yes. public interaction with objects um, than more traditional kind of publications, unfortunately, yeah. but it's something we shouldn't ignore. Sure. sure. Now, I, I think I would actually pull this together there by saying, to be honest, I, I could foresee right at the very beginning when you talked about having a, a, a new intern to look at the matter of access and barriers to access um, to heritage, the question of is that particularly relevant to portable antiquities and its area within the um, a whole of sort of heritage management and con and curation. Matter. So perhaps it, I explained that badly. Me. I think the well, idea but, is, but I think you made the point. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I think the they will be helping with more traditional portable antiquities in the work we do and yeah. gaining experience that way. It's just there from non traditional audiences of people who normally can't or wouldn't get a job with portable yeah. antiquities. Shall we say? Sure. Yeah, yeah. But I, I I think you made the point absolutely brilliantly in your presentation there of just how the artifact finds focused nature um, of portable antiquities belongs has a central place along with other things that are equally central and fundamental in a great great range of approaches to um, the past um, survey work excavation finds handling, presentation, interpretation, 
um, and so on. And, and for that, um, we're certainly very, very grateful indeed. In fact, Francis has, has put in a further point here and says, you know, maybe there is, there, 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 there's room to, you know, to engage with, an art, with art schools, not just an art school, but an art school to, to look at some of these objects produced. Absolutely. Uh, and the Saving right, Treasures yeah. tried to look at creative responses to artifacts by the public, by the wider public. So we worked with journalists to tease out narratives. We worked with creative writers to think about how we create narratives around this. We worked with photographers to get not just, you know, my um, correct, but not most illuminating photographs, but more yeah. creative photographs. And yeah, art school, anybody was kind of, we tried to engage with for that yeah. element. Great, great. Okay, well, thank you very, very much indeed, Mark. You're going to have to just imagine the round of applause that will um, follow for all of this, but, but hugely grateful for that um, presentation, which has been a, a wonderful way of starting um, what, in fact, we hope is going to be a great year um, for the Welsh Fellows Group. I'm going to uh, conclude just by uh, running through um, the plans that were, are already in hand for this year. I can't um, advise of dates um, yet, but I know that the planning is, is relatively well advanced. Um, so we are planning to have, um, as we usually do in the summer, relatively early summer, probably late June, early July, um, a day out of visit to a particular centre. And we've decided this year to, to actually go to Newport, Newport, uh, Gwent or Monmouthshire, according to which... Um, uh, language you prefer for the uh, for the county or regional um, designation there um, planning for that is 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 in place and we will be of course um, putting out you know calls for the plans and hoping that um, a good group of people will be able that all the circumstances will allow us to go on with that um, and likewise the um, weekend that the Welsh fellows have been having for several years. Um, now a weekend visit to a, a, a certain area. Um, this year, um, mid-October is what we're looking at. We haven't quite confirmed the weekend yet, but um, we're hoping it is going to be the very middle um, of October. Um, and the plan is to um, focus on Cluid and the Rithin um, area. Um, and again, for that, um, we'll be presenting um, more details as soon as we can, and particularly interesting to hear of the um, important developments at Wrexham uh, that Mark was able to tell us about. Um, my little clock in the bottom corner of my computer tells me we've now reached 1400 hours. Um, and that's the point at which I have to thank everybody, thank the speaker um, in particular very, very much. Uh, Chris, were you wanting to come in there? Um, you, you've forgot I think to mention that we do have another zoom before the meetings the St David's Day forgive me forgive me I did forget to, to, to mention that it'd be the regular thing thank you Chris yes um on the um third of March Thursday the third of March so very close to St David's Day the uh, there regularly the society holds uh, one of its ordinary meetings those are the Thursday evening lectures um on um, uh, in Cardiff. Um, that is, as I say, going to take place on the very first Thursday in March. Um, we are confident, without being 100% certain, because we can't be, um, that it is an event that will be able to have a live audience um, with indeed a real tea before it um, as well, um, and will be held in the main building of Cardiff University. Um, and um, that the, the, the details of that and the um, scope for, for booking it uh, will be on the Society's uh, website. That, of course, will also be streamed um, live um, and recorded. OK, lovely. Well, once again, thank you very, very much indeed, everybody who has um, formed the audience. Um, and thank you again, Mark, for your presentation. All the very best to everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye.